You're not using the Beats by Dre headphones over there for any... Uh, I'm not uh, hip enough for the Beats by Dre. <laughs> I put those on and their fucking stock price instantly starts to plummet. Like they lose all credibility. Are they thing. amazing? They're not, you're saying. Uh, no, I've heard they're really... I, I mean, I think they're good. And I've heard he's made more money off of those headphones than he has with oh, his, his entire music, music career. I don't, I don't give that much of a shit. Like, I'll just use earbuds. If, if yeah. I'm listening to music and I'm moving around, I probably also want to be able to hear what's happening. Yeah. The only time I've, I've ever wanted over the year is when I'm on a plane and there's just that, shh, you know what I mean? Like, you kind of want to drown that out. Yeah, you I fly on a biplane pretty regularly, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I, I, Sits on the chickens. I pilot a crop duster. <laughs> nice, nice. Those aren't my beats by Dre, uh, incidentally. They're somebody else's, and that's why they sit over there when I'm here, because I don't want to, like, you know, harsh his... You don't want to get any, uh, you know... I, I don't wanna, like I said, I don't want to devalue the, the headphones. All right, here we go. Here's a little thing, and then we'll do some stuff, and then boom. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are live. Uh, my name's uh, Joe Hicks. I'll be uh, running the boards this afternoon. Uh, this is a tight 60 podcast, roughly 60 minutes with your favorite headline comedians. Uh, as always, I am joined today by the uh, lovely, the talented, the current manager of the Seattle Comedy Underground, Mr. James Milton. Hey! And uh, also joining us today is a man who has appeared as uh, on VH1's Best Week Ever, uh, John Oliver's New York stand-up show, T.J. Miller's Mashup, was a delegate for Comedy Central's Indecision 2012, also appears as a warm-up comedian for The Daily Show and The Colbert Report, and last but not least, perhaps his greatest accomplishment of all time, he is the headliner this weekend at the Comedy Underground, Mr. Jared Logan. That's Yay. right. Don't forget that I was the winner of the Comedy Idol competition in Detroit in 2006. That's huge, Aww. man. That's huge. I like to use my worst credits <laughs> when I'm introduced. <laughs> I like that opening music. I thought we were going to watch uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High or something. And hey, you know, well, you got to... Turns out we're potting. You got to, you know, tie a few bells and whistles onto it and whatever. And uh, that's yeah. a local band, uh, Big Eyes. They're oh, cool. And they're fantastic, and I love them. And they are one of the few people who would allow us to use their shit for free. They're not so. going to sue you for... Exactly. Them. That's, yeah. you know, I'm not going to fire up any Moody Blues or anything like that. And then... Uh, no Procol Harum? No, no Procol Harum, okay. although it's tempting. I think it's okay to use any music you want as long as there's a length that you can use it, right? And then it, then they can sue you. And it's like three seconds. So you can three yeah, like but you know that three seconds of Arcade Fire, you'd be fine. Right. <laughs> well, I was just under the impression uh, that it's okay to use whatever you want as long as no, you have no listenership or no viewership. and nobody That cares. helps, and then, too. Yeah. And then as soon as like people show up, then it's like, great, now we got to go back. I'll tell you what, man. An audience ruins everything, man. <laughs> it's true, man. It's it really true. gets in the way, man. Well, you know that that girl talk dude. He got in a, he's he almost got in a bunch of trouble because he samples everything in those mashups. But I was talking to this girl who's in like pre law, and she said that his situation is unique because if they actually sued him for every single license copyright infringement, it would be billions of dollars. He could like he would never, he, he couldn't pay that. You know, it'd be right. several billion that he would be in. in so what's the resolution to that then? They just can't really do anything to that guy. What is they, they just let him do. What is Girl Talk? That's a, a it's a, a guy DJ. That, a DJ that just does. Yeah, and he does live shows, and he's pretty cool. He's got a couple songs that you might recognize. But he heavily but, samples. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like a mashup is normally like you know Fifty Cent and the Pixies or whatever. But this guy will do a song How? where it's eight or nine mashups, and then he has a twenty song album. So oh, so even if they just sued him on one song, it would be billions. Yeah, of dollars. It, it, it'd be ridiculous. How can he call that a talent though? Like, I, I, see, I suppose he's making well, the same that's argument. That's what DJing is, though. It's, it's, I mean, you're, you know. I have, no, I have a huge issue with this because I hate, a while ago, this book was a bestseller, which was uh, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, where the yeah. author just took the actual text of Pride and Prejudice oh. and stuck in <laughs> passages about zombies. And to me, I'm like, you know, kind of like, fuck you, man. Like, write a book. Yeah. Like, if you can write the passages about zombies then just write i have no problem with him like writing his own version of pride and prejudice with zombies in it but i have an issue with where he takes the actual book because it's like open li it's open license you know it's huh. like uh 
it's so old it doesn't matter well yeah. there's, there's a lot of people that say things like uh everything's derivative right and and they would make the argument well you know like you look at led zeppelin well they were just ripping off you know the but Black led Blues zeppelin are, was ripping off a lot of people well but i mean i guess that's what i'm saying a lot of people would try to make the point that everything as opposed to the rolling original. stones who are sort of you could say are derivative of of you know, 50s R&B and blues, but they kind of did it their own ways. Like Led, Led Zeppelin literally, I mean, Stairway to Heaven, there was like another 60s hippie band that did Stairway I've to heard, Heaven. I've heard that And song. then they did it, and it's, I mean, it's but of debatable. course they can't solo like Jimmy Page, so fuck them. You know? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they get nothing. <laughs> no, I don't like repurposing. I don't like that. Well, I think typically comedians would probably take offense to that more than anyone else because it's such a big issue with, you know, borrowing other people's material or like taking a bit that is clearly somebody else's but just tagging it a little and then hey now it's mine and whatever P comedians seem to take more offense to that sort of thing than because i've heard because like me, i've heard people make the argument oh well what about cover bands isn't that the same thing as a comic going up on stage and doing somebody else's <laughs> material you know and uh Personally, I, I don't see no, how you can right? make those comparisons. No, right? I, I did a gig one time in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, outdoors at this like boating club for all these like meatheads that own boats but have money in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And it was me and a guy called Rockin' Rick. <laughs> and I went up and just bombed horribly for about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then Rock and Rick got up and did verbatim Rodney Dangerfield. Wow! Oh, wow. Like uh, that I'd heard off of Rodney and Dangerfield I bet he killed album. With it too. Destroyed. <laughs> That's what they wanted. <laughs> I was Rush. like, man, I wish I had brought my and when Kenny Youngman. When when was this? <laughs> a couple of years ago. Because a, a lot of comedy doesn't seem to have a good shelf life. It's almost surprising that somebody would go up there with some old Dangerfield bits and just like destroy the place. Dangerfield bits are sort of evergreen. Yeah, yeah. I love. And also, love, if you're in Sheepshead Bay, your culture hasn't developed to the point <laughs> where you <laughs> want Dangerfield. Was yeah, doing exactly. It's, yeah. Still, it's still 1972. I mean, a lot of times, if I'm like in some kind of gig like that, I'm like, God damn it! If only I had terrible bits from 40 years ago, <laughs> I would. They would love me. That's how you become a well-rounded comic. You you get those terrible bits from 40 years ago. You can keep those in your pocket. You gotta do the too, take my know. wife. That's what I'm. Do, I'm doing my own Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. As soon as some old comedians' routines become in the public domain, I'm going to do them. Like right now, I do old um, W. C. Field vaudeville <laughs> routines Some in my arbuckle. Yeah, but I'll put like iPods or like hip hop <laughs> in them. Red buttons. Take my yeah. iPod, please. Yeah, red skeleton. I'll do soupy sales bits, <laughs> but I, I modernize them. I put zombies in them. <laughs> That's all you need. So I saw you recently at a fantastic <coughs> show uh, this Wednesday, and uh, there was a lot of crowd work involved. And I was wondering, like, uh, you're a warm-up comic for the Colbert Report and the, the Daily Show. Is that a lot of uh, – does th is that kind of how that job turns out a lot too, where you just kind of well, talk to the crowd? Or do you go out there and do bits? Or yeah. You can't, right? You can't do bits, can you? Um, they well, you know, I, I, I actually don't like to talk about it too much only because sometimes they get a little touchy about what you say about the show. Sometimes Understandably. Uh, yeah, who knows if they they one ever. of our seven listeners could. I be mean, I, even if I was uh, I mean, even if I was on some crazy Mark Marin podcast, who knows yeah, if they'd yeah. ever hear it? So I don't mm -hmm. mind like saying a little bit, but like, yeah, they. Um, I really, I've only, I've only like worked on the Daily Show one time. Now Colbert, I'm one of the regular guys, and we only do crowd work. We only wow. do crowd work. But I don't think that I learned. You know, I didn't learn crowd work on that job. You know, I had to have a grounding in it before I I did it. And then some nice uh, women at Comedy Central who knew me recommended me for the job because they knew I was able to do that. Cool. Did, did I think the reason that they don't want you to do bits, and by the way, bits get in and it's fine. You know, like if, if a bit comes up in conversation with an audience member, I do a bit. Yeah. But um, I think the reason is that they want really, you know, the writers and, and the hosts to decide what the show is about, you know? Uh, and if I come in with topics, I'm tone. kind of, yeah, I'm yeah. kind of giving the show a flavor before they've been given a chance to give the show a flavor. Mm -hmm. So it makes total sense to me, you know? So do you go in there just like with no net, just like, all right, I'm uh, just going to pick somebody? And Absolutely, run. yeah. I have a question. Do you, do you use wireless mics, or <clears throat> are you on like a ShamWow headset? <laughs> How does wow. They have me, I, I'm sitting in a boom like a boom rig with uh, a mic on the end, and I have to control it to it's go. It's diesel-powered, right? And if I, if I 
make the altitude on it too low, I'll hit someone in the head, and that's happened a couple times. Wait, so you're on a, on a no, of I course was, not. It's I was just almost, a wireless mic. I was almost believing it, man. I what was a there. Weird I could, question. I could see it in my head. Do you wear a headset and then just talk well, so actually, close to the well, person you could kiss them? Actually, <laughs> Wednesday it became an issue, I remember. You jumped off the stage like a ninja. You and, almost died. Uh, oh, well, because I there was, was... The cord got was tangled up wire, the tables. Yeah, because the, the underground you got so a wire mic. Yeah. I prefer a wireless mic for that reason, because I like to go talk to the crowd. Yeah. yeah. Now, there was a guy there, and I don't want to keep harping on it, but it was intriguing to me, because there was actually a table there, and they said they were from England, and they quote-unquote didn't understand... American humor, which how they could have possibly wound up at an American comedy club, I'm not sure. Do you think there's a distinction, a, a vast cultural gap between UK comedy and well, American let, let, comedy? Or should yeah. you just have bits about shepherd's pie? Let, this is exactly what happened. Is I, I, I'm, I'm doing my set, and it, it, you know it's a Wednesday night, so it's not very full. <laughs> and I've got this British guy on the front row with his arms crossed and a frown on his face. Yep. And I can tell that he's, not only is he not trying to enjoy it but he's like trying to put out a vibe like i don't like this mm -hmm. so all i did was like go there i think very politely say hey what kind of humor do you like because that's kind of funny to me yeah, yeah see if i can figure out well, maybe it's, a, I've, it's happened before it's some girls been like question i'm a feminist and then i'll i'll pull out a bit that's feminist you know or something like that so so i asked him and he i said what kind of humor do you like and he was like british humor which is not something I can do, and, and no matter what I, hmm. unless I came with like you know. What if you pulled out an old Monty Python bit? And right, just <laughs> and and then you would have killed. But you know, uh, clearly he didn't know what he just did wanted to express the fact that he he didn't want to be there hmm. because then his wife's like sarcastic, be sarcastic, and I'm like, you guys are. Um, uh, what would I want to say? They're, they're fuckwits because <laughs> clearly a lot of what I was doing was sarcastic. What, what are you talking yeah. about? That's like 80% of comedy right They there. literally wanted me to be something else, you know. So it was no pr pleasing him. Yeah. Do you, does, do you Everybody run? else is having a good time. That's what annoyed me is yeah. that he was like a holdout. Do you run into that Well, you know, lot? Jared, you just don't appeal to 75-year-old British transplants that's a key demographic i want too, everybody right to there. enjoy themselves but I, I but but if i see that someone's not even trying well that's mm. not my fault and that annoys me about them mm. does, because sometimes i fail and it's my fault i'll openly admit it but does you know. the crowd work ever go horribly wrong sure uh pro probably not as much anymore but it, it kind of did on thursday night oh yeah this week well, well, i wasn't there a tiny bit what happened? Yeah. But I, I feel bad. At, you know, you're always supposed to like when you're in the entertainment industry, you're supposed to just talk yourself up all the time and be like, "No, I'm pretty awesome. Like, <laughs> I only good. I only kill, and it's because <laughs> I've just been in this yeah. business so long." I, I never trust a comic who like talks like that. The only ones I listen to and talk to are the ones who like can openly be like, "Oh, I was terrible," and "Oh, that didn't go too." Like, never, like, not always like, "Oh, it's terrible," but able to admit when it is like what it is you know no i'm actually <laughs> proud of what happened on thursday night there were these uh, there's this table of black guys that came in they were the only black guys in the whole club and uh i asked if anybody in the crowd was jewish and one of the black guys spoke for everyone was like no nah. <laughs> and then i made some comment about that i don't remember what my comment was but i was trying to make a joke about how like it would be funny if only the black guys hated jewish people you know what i mean because it wasn't it funny. <laughs> it wasn't funny, and then I realized it, and I kept moving on. But I think then the black guys were like, "What the fuck was that about?" You know, <laughs> and subtle all, little they, thing. Yeah, they all started like talking to each other, and I could tell that they were like, "Why is it about race all of a sudden?" And I, you know, I was well, I happy with how I dealt with it, though. I think your point is kind of that it was ironic that uh, that they were sort of uh, a group that had also been prejudiced against and they were sort of casting a little bit of prejudice it sounded like they were casting a little prejudice uh, when you Jewish brought that people. up yeah 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 it was, so it was, it was sort funny. of a whole ironic situation and, it was like but the, like i was very quick to be like there are no jews here you know yeah yeah anyway i i, I was but they did enjoy you though the whole show and no, they were and, great and i know that because because they were saying things like he's stupid he dumb he's <laughs> you stupid. dumb he's stupid <laughs> and that's uh, that's a sign of accomplishment when <laughs> Now it's about race. Now it's officially no, become just, racist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. Anyway. They. Yeah. So I kind of had to stop the show and be like, explain what I was trying to say to them, and mm. it was hilarious because it was just so pathetic. <laughs> I just decided to abase myself and be pathetic and apologize. 
for making a weird joke. Um, but you were speaking about if the crowd work has ever gone wrong. You did a show. Uh, you were telling me a thing about uh, you were somewhere in New York, right, where a guy right hit you over the head with a microphone. Yeah, tell us yeah. about that. How did he get a microphone? Well, what happened was there was this show. It was a, a nice little like alternative show in the in the e- East Village in New York. It normally not any kind of like a rowdy show. And uh, these guys showed up from a hardcore music concert. Nice. You know, hardcore music. Like, I've got you. You know, it's like that. <laughs> and, like, they all came in and, like, there were 40 of them. And before there were, like, 20 people, like, who were enjoying the show and laughing. And then twice that number of hardcore guys came in. Yeah, hardcore guys and their women came in. And they were just talking full voice and completely ignoring the show in just one room, you know. And it's like the the host was like, this isn't working. I think I'm going to cancel the rest of the show. And there were t- still two guys. One of them was me to go up. And me and the other guy were like, no, we want to go up, you know. And he was like, okay. So he puts my, my friend Matt up. And Matt uh, kind of tried to do a set for five minutes and was like, this isn't working. And just got off. Mm-hmm. But, of course, I go up and I'm like, I'm the master of crowd work. Let Watch me show this. you what I do. <laughs> I'm gonna. This is gonna be awesome. Mm-hmm. So first, I, I, which I always think I try to do because I'm nice. I try to be nice, and I was just like, "What's hardcore music? Tell me about hardcore music. What what concert did you guys come from?" Zero recognition that I'm speaking into a microphone, like just talking full voice, like I'm not even there. And so then I started being, and I thought I was being silly. But I was like, hardcore music sucks. <laughs> hardcore music is the worst music imaginable. Mm. You know, I'd rather listen to like an old man gargle than listen to that garbage or something like that. So then I started getting looks from like a couple of like the nicer hardcore guys that were kind of like ixnay, mm. like, why don't you stop? And then what had happened right before was my buddy Neil had been like, Hey, why don't you say your mothers are cunts? I dare you. <laughs> and like I was like, idea. I take your dare. So when I was on stage, I, I mean, at a certain point, I was just screaming at them, trying to get them to pay attention in any way I could. And I said, your mothers are cunts and all this horrible, horrible, terrible stuff. But I, w- I thought I was being silly because I always think that I'm not threatening at all. I look like, you know, a plump little uh, silly lesbian man. I don't look scary or like mm-hmm. I'm serious about any of that. And I certainly wasn't serious about it. But uh, anyway, this guy who was a very hardcore, he was like six foot six. The hardest core. If the you hardest will. core. He, he was covered in tats. He was, it was understated though. Like he wasn't trying to be hardcore. He, he just was hardcore. He was the pack leader. He was, uh, he was an alpha. Yeah, he came out of the crowd and he didn't say a word to me. He easily pried the mic out of my hand in one quick motion <laughs> and smashed it over my head as hard as he could. <laughs> That's actually kind of hilarious. Dude, it broke on my head. They broke the microphone? The microphone broke on my head. I, it, I was bleeding a little bit. I wasn't bleeding a lot. I didn't have, like, a head wound. But I was bleeding a little bit. I'd been cut a little bit. Now, here's the thing. Then he started screaming at me, like, going, like, I'm from New York. Where are you from? I'm from New York. And, like, in my head, I'm, like, thinking, like, I knew I wasn't hurt. So I was, like, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> this is so cool. That's but fun. I knew if I smiled or acted that way, he would continue to beat the living shit out of me. Hmm. So I kind of was just like, I'm from West Virginia. Why are we talking about our geographic place of origin? And then, I didn't say that part. but And then he was like, get the fuck out. Get out. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to leave the bar. <laughs> but you win. Like, show's over. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, uh, and then, you know, so I stayed. By the way, none of my friends helped me. <laughs> Not even the guy that told you to open with the, your mother's or cunts? No. Uh, a bit of crowd work? He bought me a beer later. <laughs> the bartender bought me a beer. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting there, and then the host, uh, Booker, comes over, and he's like, you broke the microphone. With oh, your you broke the microphone. With your head. The microphone, yeah. yeah. Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, and then he, and then that, that guy, uh, <laughs> he wanted me to talk to the cops and all this shit, and I was like, I'm not talking to the cops about this. I don't, I'm not going to press charges. Are you crazy? 
And then, uh, and then he didn't book me for a while because I was a troublemaker. Wow. <laughs> now, was that a comedy club or was that just a bar? It was just like a it. bar show. Yeah, that's one of the weird things about comedy. Like a lot of times, just by virtue of having a microphone in your hand and being on stage, like suddenly you assume some level of authority with everybody else in the room. But right. it doesn't always work that way. And when it doesn't work that way. I don't think that, uh, that approach doesn't really work in general, though, right? Like if I'm the authority. Well, I don't think you have to say anything. I just think, like, people assume, like, oh, this guy has a microphone in his hand and nobody else does, so clearly, like, he's the professional, like, he's the, the adult in the scenario, and we have to listen to him. Like, at a comedy club, especially... The talking stick. Yeah, well, at a comedy club, that's that's how it goes, but a lot of times, like, these bar showcases, or shows, it's, it's like you never know, and if... You have a crowd or you're confronted with people in that scenario who don't automatically have that intuitive, like, whatever it is, social instinct to think, oh, well, this person's in charge now. Mm -hmm. It's horrible being the guy with the microphone and everybody else is like, why does this guy have it? Who gave this guy a microphone? Well, I think why that's why part of it, though, talking? like, if you're doing bar shows, like, you know, like, I don't know how that show was, but some places are known for having comedy shows there, right? So people kind of know walking in, like, oh, they always do comedy every Thursday night or whatever. But I remember that show we did in, in Fremont where yeah. there are times where people walk in and they're like, what the fuck is going on? Who we just came here for a beer. Yeah, an and then, show. Yeah, they walk in and then the guy's like, look at me. Listen to me. I'm talking. And they're just like, I just came for a manny's, dude. I don't know what the fuck's yeah. going on here. You know, so I think, you know, it, it all depends on sort True. of. Well, clearly, I learned a lesson that I that I needed to learn. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I, I I wanted to see how far I could push the buttons, and then I found out. Well, you got very admit, clearly. You got to admit that's kind of a unique crowd, though. I mean, I don't think you're going to go up against that crowd very often. You know. No, but still, it was it was it was educational. I think, and I, <laughs> and I, I am glad that I made him do that. Actually, in hmm. retrospect, I'm glad that I got some reaction. You know, yeah. th that's what I was trying to do, and I got it. You know? yeah, yeah. Well, that's the weird thing. Like, there are actually a lot of comics out there who have stories about being sort of assaulted on stage. Right. It's kind of a weird. And these are people whose job it is to make people laugh. Like, well, how does it, I know being beat up. Uh, uh, Steve Byrne got hit over the head with a. Something happened to him at Comic Strip Live several years ago, and I've heard from people that he he can be kind of a dick to the audience or I, whatever I heard, like if it's not going i heard that jim gaffigan of all people like got in a little tussle with an audience member huh. once at a show because he said something about his wife or whatever wow. yeah, jim, sure. jim gaffigan of all people like the hot pockets dude well, you like know what throwing you, not to sound too like um i don't know waxing philosophical but what you learn is like even when you start doing like talking head shows or any kind of tv there's a whole giant team of people dedicated to making sure you don't say certain things um. because saying things is like it it creates a strong emotional sometimes violent reaction in people huh. it's like the most dangerous thing you can do <laughs> is like say things people don't like and so that's why people get comedians get attacked sometimes yeah. because you know people are, are not used to hearing someone just say whatever's on their mind or whatever yeah but uh yeah i mean yeah there's been a lot of people get got attacked on stage there's a pretty funny clip of uh Pauly shore i don't know if it's real but there's oh, a clip I've of Pauly that, shore yeah. getting punched in the face by this like in texas by this big shit kicking yeah i'm pretty sure that's dude. real yeah I think that like if you're not saying something that makes that if, if everything you're saying everybody loves and thinks is fine, then you're not doing it. You're not really being like a great comedian. Huh. I don't mean I mean, I, ideally, every table would be laughing, but some of the tables would be laughing like despite themselves or despite what they think is right or wrong. You know well, what I mean? Yeah. Like, well, and you also kind of have to figure if you're getting a laugh out of everybody the whole time as good as it may seem like it's going there's probably a strong possibility that you're kind of hitting the lowest common denominator you right know? i mean you know what i love are comedians like sean Patton, who starts the bit with a statement that almost everybody's going to hate like yeah. Yeah. and then d he basically doesn't dig a hole. He basically blasts open a hole in the ground and then climbs out of it. Yeah, yeah. Larry With David jokes. used to do that too. I think he used to have a bit about Hitler where he would open it up and just like basically was like trying to say nice things about Hitler. You know, which yeah. Is like obviously everybody's going to disagree with it. Only a Jewish comedian could do that bit, though, right? 
Uh, I don't know. Is Norm Macdonald Jewish? He has a similar bit, too. You know? Oh, really? But He's uh, Canadian. Is it, <laughs> that counts. I, t- I was telling you about a bit I do where if uh, someone leaves the room during the set, oh, yeah. I tell the audience that when they come back in, I'm just going to start saying crazy shit, and I want the whole audience to cheer. So when the person comes back in from the bathroom, I'm like, and that's why Hitler was right, and then the whole audience <laughs> cheers. <laughs> I'll also do it like... Uh, I'll also do it like if there's like a speaker giving the act to the outside because people walking by will just think it's a Nazi rally. <laughs> or um, the re- most recently I did a show in the subway in Brooklyn. Huh. We were just in the subway. Nice. And, and, and I told this, in, I mean, it was a mixed group of people, white, black, Latino. I was like, I'm going to start saying crazy, horrible shit, and I want you guys all to cheer. So I was like, the white race is the one true race like <laughs> and people getting off the subway were like what the fuck is going on <laughs> it's just now, new york now, man see that's a moment where you might get your ass kicked i mean talking earlier where you're just like uh well i guess calling the guys you know now that i think about it you have some very volatile material you know calling guys cunts and the white <laughs> race is the super calling race, guys you know? cunts yeah very smart material <laughs> yeah, not I'm everybody gets that the... no but i mean like that was like a, a joke like you know they were i would only do that in front of a mixed crowd if how, they were like you, all laughing at how it, do you yeah. end up doing a show in a subway Oh, God. Well, you know, New York has a lot of, uh, you know, you talk about alternative shows. You mean a bar (laughs) show usually, but New York, you'll end up doing alternative, alternative shows. Like, I've done shows in subways. Like that it, was is for it the literally the tunnel or a car? Or? No, no. It was, it was, you know, it's where you get off the subway and then you walk down into the area where there's, like, places to buy water and uh. chips. And this was uh, – some weird hipsters opened a zine store <laughs> in the subway. I think it's a bad idea. I can't <laughs> imagine it's making money. But they took over this old stall where a guy used to be selling, like, you know, candy bars, and mm-hmm. now they're selling zines. Zines. That's like the hipster means. word for magazine, I'm assuming. Well, it's like homemade magazines or homemade uh, comic books. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, you I don't know what the mag- rent is on a place like that, but I, I don't know if they're making it, doing that, but that's like right in like the williamsburg part of, you know, Brooklyn is where they're doing that. Mm-hmm. Hmm. But I've also done in New York shows at like a needle exchange program. <laughs> Wow. Put down those needles and get ready to laugh, folks. Yeah, uh, you know, where it's like just a bunch of people that are just trying to get off the smack, like watching you and like. We did a, a little uh, quick improv. Uh, I don't know if you want to call it a show uh, on the light rail here in Seattle. Me and some friends of mine, we just grabbed a microphone that wasn't even plugged into anything and just got on the car and just. Ladies and gentlemen, as soon yeah. as it started up and uh, the Cameron Mazuka was with us that day, he went up there and did like five minutes just on the little leg from one to the other and like uh, it was a weird uh it was a weird response from people they didn't like half of the car loved it half like hated it it was funny and can i say i mean and with these sorts of shows we're kind of blurring the line between stand-up comedian and homeless ranter yeah, it's right? true. It's yeah. true. well we just wandered around the microphone day. is basically the difference between you just <laughs> That's exactly screaming it. at people on well, public transportation. Yeah, let, let, let me be clear. I, I would rather be in front of a bunch of people that paid to be there, and uh, I'm getting paid. Than, uh, <laughs> no, that's how desperate we are. We just grabbed a couple cameras and a microphone and just wandered around town. And we did a show in a laundromat and uh, one on the monorail and then in the light rail. And <laughs> but that stuff's fun, though, and it makes you way better comedian if you do a lot of oh, it. Let me, let me tell you, if you do one of these, uh, we were calling it uh, guerrilla comedy, I think. If you do one of these, uh, everybody who did one, when they, when they like, got off the stage, so to speak, there was such a rush, such an adrenaline rush, such a stage sure. dump, if you will. Because hey, it's listen, such if a you can kill crap. on the King County Metro bus, <laughs> you can kill anywhere. Well, well no, but because you're breaking, like, a cultural taboo. It's yeah. like you realize how hardwired it is into your brain that yeah. when you break it, you're like, oh, oh, oh. We, we went down <laughs> to uh, Pike Market with Mitch Burrow and just stepped out into the middle of the street and started it up. And he was he went for maybe three minutes. And at the end of three minutes, he drew a crowd. There were people, like, standing there, like, laughing, listening, applauding. It was really So were you using a uh, some sort of, like, uh, amplify, portable amplifier? No, that's the crazy part. You just use the microphone because it's sort of like the universal symbol for a stand-up ah. comic, right? And I would just walk out there and ladies and gentlemen give a big like crazy intro and dude you should get like a pig nose amplifier i think you can battery power those and then walk around you know just like i think that'd be pretty rad i think simplicity is the key to this though we did one in a mcdonald's uh that was not and then the manager threatened to call 911 on us because we were telling jokes in mcdonald's (laughs) that was fun (laughs) yeah it's a fine line you know between (laughs) gorilla comedy and bothering people while they're eating (laughs) 
<laughs> but that is what I liked about New York, though, is that cool stuff it would happen like that. Like, uh, I was on the, tr- on the, on the train. Um, oh, that show in the subway got shut down by the cops right away, by the way. <laughs> While you were there? <laughs> yeah, I was, like, the first one up. So I got done with my entire set, and then it got shut down. Oh, okay. Cops. That's what, was it shut down because the, I mean I'm assuming they had the zine shop there for a Do while. Do you need a so permit or something the like zine is that? Shop, it was the grand opening of the zine oh, shop. Oh, I see. Huh. Wow, what a cool. gig! Did you get paid for that? No. In <laughs> zines, did they didn't give you a complimentary <laughs> zine? I did it. Yeah, man, I did it to like be part of the community, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now into zines, man. Was that when you were just kind of starting out in New York, or no? That was, was pretty that, like, recently, week? actually. Oh, so you you uh, you'll go and just like uh right. So yeah. So I mean, I you know I uh, I tour to make money, but when I'm in New York, I'll do any kind of weird show that I get offered. Usually, unless it just sounds like a total horrible pain in the ass, I'll do it. Hmm. But the subway gig didn't sound like a pain in the ass. That sounded it didn't. It sounded interesting. Yeah, I saw one of the coolest things in New York subway. The guy he was playing, uh, he had an electric violin going into a wah wah pedal. Oh, yeah. And then he was had the backing track from Michael Jackson's Billie Jean, and he was just soloing his ass off like Paganini, but like Hendrix, because like through a through a wah wah pedal, it was the coolest fucking thing I've ever that seen. Sounds cool. Yeah. My favorite part about that story was the Paganini reference. That was pretty Thank solid, you. man. Thank you. I, I know 18th century. Yeah. Well, I know. Do you know who uh, Joshua Bell is? He's like one of the. He's nope. like this world renowned nope. uh, violin player, and uh, he set up with like a Stradivarius in the subway and just play and like you know just with a baseball hat and his name played. And, wow. And uh, so yeah. That's New York subways, man. That's the that's the cultural hotbed of America. A right lot now, of music goes on down there. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I wish they would shut it off, please. <laughs> when there, there are guys that just beat on drums or beat on not even drums, but on like big cans. Yeah, like a like five stomp. gallon laundry no. bucket. Yeah, and I'm like. All right, thanks. That's how it is downtown Seattle. They did a news report here. They f- they talked to one of those guys. Apparently, he was clearing like forty grand a year, beating on a bucket outside of a movie really? theater. Yeah, he'd be out there every day, and they said he was making a great living at Good it. Good for him. I mean, there's one guy in Seattle that does it, and he's got like a symbol and a couple other things. And he, you can tell by like his syncopations that he varies that he actually has some musical some skill and training. Yeah, training, but then, some bucket beating training, or he plays the drums or whatever. Yeah. But then there's other guys who it's like, oh, you just have two tied buckets no. and and the willingness to annoy others. I know I'm being a dick, but you know, like sometimes New York City is enough like having someone beating on a bucket right by your ear all day <laughs> without someone literally beating on a bucket right by your ear. Yeah. So I'd rather just not hear it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, those guys, they've got it good. They're making seventy eight thousand a year on their buckets. <laughs> I don't know about seventy eight, but they don't have to work. So I was looking at your website earlier yes. and I noticed uh which is uh Jaredlogan dot com by the way, and I noticed that uh, it's covered in uh drawings of what I believe to be is yourself slaying giant frogs and yes. uh, <laughs> fairy princesses. I kind of need to update it a little bit. Those are kind of old, but yeah, I, I draw some. Yeah. Did you? So uh, we did, did you go to school for that, or do you? Still no, draw I went to school for theater, so I'm using my degree. I guess I have some jokes about that. And then I always thought I was going to be an, uh, a visual, like a cartoonist or something. Until they're good. Draw. I mean, I couldn't draw that well. I mean, it's very clear representation. You know what would be funny though is that it, you'd realize is is really funny is that there's a lot of comedians who can draw. Um, huh. Like Pete Holmes had a bunch of cartoons in the New Yorker. Joe Rogan wanted oh, to well. be a cartoonist yeah. for a long time too. He yeah. to this day he draws like little Hulk Hogan's and stuff everywhere he goes. Yeah, yeah, and you you know people are like uh, they like the. Uh, the humor and the comics when they're young, you know, and then mm-hmm. for whatever reason they end up moving into performing. I don't know why, but hmm. yeah, I like to draw. I, I don't do it enough. I wish I did it more or I wish I, I need to figure out a way to do like a web comic or something. Yeah. But I need yeah. the, the web, like web part comic. of that. Someone to come in with the web side of that and help me out. I'm you not do a, tablet. a, a web you guy. Can, well, you, you draw on you the got, tablet. You managed to get these drawings on your website. Like yeah. I, that was thing? a, 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 a very nice girl named Mend- Megan Pendergrass did my website. She does an awesome job. So I gave her just like ink drawings, and she put them on the on the website for me. Hmm. Well, I'm sure you could find somebody to do that if you showed up with like you know your ink drawings and said to make this a web comic. You no, know, it's like cool. a lot of things. I I really I I, I l- I'd love to do it. I am going to do it, but it's time. You got it takes so much time. 
Right now I'm working on a web series and trying to get like a uh, showcase of my own up in New York. A new What's regular the web showcase. series? Web series. I don't want to talk too much before I you know, actually get it made. <laughs> but involved we, in these projects we, that I can't talk about. Like comedy <laughs> well, no, it's just, you know, you don't want to be like, it's going to be this and this. And then, you yeah. know, maybe maybe yeah. it gets delayed or something. But we're going to do like an interview series where I interview people. Oh, cool. But um, it's not going to be strictly um, – me being me, it's not going to be like this. It's, it's not going to be real. It's going right, to be right. weird. And you're are you just going to upload this to YouTube, or do you have a I deal with somebody? Free. Cool. I, I just want it to be free and have something that shows me acting a little bit. It's nice. So you're you're kind of a well, you have a theater background, right? I guess there's, right. there's kind of a fine, like you said, there's kind of a fine line between a lot of comics and artists, or, or a lot of comics like to draw. And it seems like there's a lot of actor comics too. It's almost like a natural progression. Like a lot of comics want to get their sitcom or whatever, and they almost fit like Louis and there's uh, some there's some people in comedy who I think are are more should just like the actor entertainer end you know mm -hmm. like uh, and then there are some who are just like hardcore stand ups you know I like stand up more that's you know what I mean I mm -hmm. think because one you're completely in control you know you don't have to go by what other people tell you to put in it or change it in any way you know you're the boss of it you know. Uh, when immediate. you fail, it's on you. When you succeed, you succeeded, you know. Um, but I also, you know, you can't – being a stand-up is not the most direct way to, you know, making enough money to have a family and a house and everything. So I love doing all these other things too. I love doing Best Week Ever and uh, True TV and all that stuff I do. True TV? Isn't that the court TV channel? Yeah, but I do World's Dumbest on there. Oh, World's Dumbest Criminals? It's just talking, talking heads. Yeah, mm. I w they send you a bunch of videos. You watch them. You write jokes on them. You go in and make fun of the videos. And then the paycheck comes in the mail. It's fun. Nice. <laughs> it's like professional Beavis and Butthead. Man. Yeah, it's totally. Huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> awesome gig and if you can get it. It's a good gig, yeah. And, and they're very nice to me, and they bring me in. It feels like about once a week, so... Those are, are are those in New York also? So you have That's to really also yeah. out of New York, but they can film you in L.A. too. Oh, okay. So like I go to pilot season now when they're making the you know when they're trying to cast the pilots every year, mm. and uh, I can just do that from L.A. Cool. From there. Cool. So how was Chicago? You spent a lot of time in Chicago. That's yeah, where you I was in Chicago chops. from 2003 to 2008. Is, did you get out a lot? Hit a lot of clubs or? Oh yeah. Scene well, uh, I. Well, of course, you know, it took a while to get rolling. I don't think I probably did the Zanies, which is the m local club there. Now there's several clubs. They've yeah. got a laugh isn't factory it, there. and they've got a city based up. out of there, too, or something? Yep. Mm -hmm. And I did I did uh, all the alt shows in Chicago, which at that time it was an awesome time to be a comedian, to be even like an alternative comedian in Chicago because that's when Pete Holmes was there, Camille Nanjiani, T.J. Miller – uh, Kyle Kinane had just left when I got there, and uh, a bunch of other great people, you know, Hannibal, Barres, mm -hmm. and all these people. So mm -hmm. I was doing comedy with all of those guys and uh, a ton of other funny people. And then, uh, yeah, but, you know, as far as clubs go, we were having so much fun doing, like, Chicago Underground Comedy and the Lincoln Lodge that – when I finally started getting like to MC at Zany's Comedy Club, I was like, oh, good, that too. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. It, it wasn't really about money, you know, trying to do something creative, you know. How old were you? 23 is when I started. So I was 28 when I left for New York hmm. in 2008. Did you move to Chicago for comedy? or did I you, kind like of did. I, I, had, I had finished my major in theater and... When I first got to Chicago, I did, like, lighting design for plays, and mm -hmm. I, uh, I assistant directed plays. Mm -hmm. I didn't really act in any. Mm -hmm. And I thought I might be doing theater stuff, but then I started doing stand-up, and I l immediately knew that that's what I needed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And there was always in the back of my mind that that's what I was going to do. Did, and so did you go to college in West Virginia? or in No, in Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee. Oh, cool. Yeah. It gets kind of complicated. I was in West Virginia till I was 16. Then my family moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, where my brother still lives. Then I moved to Memphis for college. And then I went, like, straight north to Chicago after college. I'd never been to Chicago when I moved to Chicago. Wow. I moved there sight unseen. I just knew I wanted to be in a big city where there was arts. Yeah. You know, something artistic to get into, you know. And I ended up trying an open mic. And at the time in Chicago, they had I, I, what I'm going to say is probably the greatest open mic that ever existed. 
which was this open mic. I mean, I mean, period in history of comedy. <laughs> in the I, mean, I, I, I mean, I mean, w- I I've talked to everybody I've ever met in comedy, and no one has ever said that they they've seen anything like the Lions Den in Chicago in like oh three oh four oh five, where there was this open mic that would had all these great comics going up on it, like Kumail and TJ, right? And you would get anywhere from 50 to 100 regular, normal, not going up audience members wow. per week yeah. that would just come in and watch it. And then they had these two guys, Steve O'Harvey and Josh Cheney, kind of curating it so that every couple of people you got someone good up, you know. And the audience loved it all, you know. And the audience would laugh at someone if they were bad, you know. And they were only up there for like, uh, I don't know, how, I can't remember how long it was. You got like, depending on how many people. But they would go. It would go to two a.m. It would start at like seven thirty or something like that, and it would go all night long. Whoa. And we thought that's what open mics were like, because <laughs> that's the dream. first open mic we had ever been to. We Whoa. were like, "Oh, stand up's easy and awesome. <laughs> <laughs> People come and see you." And it was a great crowd too, because it was this weird Chicago crowd that had. White people, black people, Latino people, old people, young people, rich people, poor people. How much did it cost to get in? Nothing. Oh, it was well, all it. free. Did they serve booze there? They had drink specials for the comics. And this bartender would just keep hooking you up if you were a comedian. Uh-huh. Uh, of course, this was not a business model that could be sustained forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, eventually, the owner of the bar was a very, very cool guy. He sold the bar. And uh, it became like a soccer bar. And I think the people that ran the open mic were like, can we, can we please keep doing this? And they were like, no. Ooh. And what dipshits they were because they basically, just because they didn't like the idea of a stand-up show, mm-hmm. turned down so much traffic. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that was the end of that little era. I was in Chicago a couple you know, years after it, it, it folded, but uh, that open mic. But that open mic was really what got a lot of us, I think, hooked. Yeah, that's crazy. There's a lot of venues who will try to put on like an open mic or a comedy showcase or whatever who aren't particularly maybe a comedy club. And they just seems like they don't understand. Like they think all you need to do is get a few comics in here and then boom, the place will be packed and everybody will be happy. And, and of course, it doesn't work that way. You got to put a lot more effort into it than that. But you uh, got to get good comics, too. You know, yeah. sometimes I see yeah. new guys starting out and they're not that good yet. Right. But they have the right idea. They're going to start their own show, whether it be an open mic or a showcase show. OK. That's great. And you're not that good yet. No problem. Everybody starts out somewhere. Get the best people on it. Yeah. yeah. Get the best people on it. If that means so there's two, three people that are going up every month, fine. Because if you're trying to build an audience, you can't do a lot of spot trading and like, you know, you can't, you can't, you've got to have like a standard. Yeah. And you might be below your own standard. That's yeah. fine. Well, Few people have the the are secure enough to admit that that they are yeah. below their own standards. I'm the worst guy on the show. Well, that's yeah, that, yeah. That's one of the problems with a lot of comics, especially when they're first starting out, is they 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 take it so personal, right? So rather than like be honest with each other and be like, yeah, you know, I th- maybe that wasn't such a great set. Everybody's like, oh, great set, bro. Good set. Like everybody's so like self congratulatory and slapping everybody on the back, like, oh, that's so fun. And, like, in person. Can, yeah, perhaps. right, 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 right. You know. And but so then let a message board fire up, and you'll learn. <laughs> like, right. Someone Anonymity really makes about you. fools of us all. But you know, the other thing is, if you're uh, curating a show. Guess what? You're not doing it for you, really. Yeah. Uh, uh, like uh, creating a show is for the show needs to be for the audience, for the comedians you have on, or for both. But it's not really for you. Mm. Also, hosting is not really stand up, by the way. I mean, it is, but it's not. It's like it's hosting. It's a different thing, you know. Huh. And I, a lot of times, I'll see young stand ups get up to host a show, and they're like, "Here's my showcase." No. Your job is to get the crowd ready for the guys that were, you know, booked to showcase, really. Huh. When even, even, you know, I mean, great, great, amazing comedians like, well, like Pete Holmes and Jesse Klein had a show in New York for a while. And, like, when they would host, they would, they would host. They would crowd work. They would get people excited. They might do a couple bits. But hosting is not the time for you to go. And now let's get deep into my world and psyche. It's uh-huh. not. It's time yeah. for you to wake people up and get them excited. Mm-hmm. And host the show. Yeah, you know? yeah. There's also other guys I've seen that would host a show, and they would go up, and they would do like, "Hello." 
they would do like uh, 10 minutes uh, in between every act. Like, they, okay, this next comic, well, first this reminds me of, and then it's yeah, like yeah, 10 yeah. minutes yeah. later, it's classic like, Classic amateur on. mistake or you classic know, veteran mistake because I know guys who do that who've been doing comedy for 15 years. Yeah, usually when they have a couple drinks in them too, maybe. I've seen <laughs> they <laughs> just, you know, comics are selfish. They don't really want to be hosting. They want to be showcasing. Huh. That's true. I, I just think people should be honest. Do you want to host the show? No, I'll do a spot. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. like to host. Yeah. Well, and the hosting's it, not for everybody. I couldn't imagine, like, a Stephen Wright kind of guy, like, hosting a show, right? Like, it would be, t- you know, it doesn't seem like a good fit, but you'd be surprised sometimes. Like, I saw Mike Lawrence. Do you know his comedy at all? Uh, a little bit. Not. He, he's a good buddy of mine, and he's, he's got kind of, like, a very dark kind of sense of humor sometimes, and he's not exactly, like, Mr., like, super high energy, Party bubbly. Yeah. yeah. He's not always immediately likable, but he actually was a fantastic host the one time I saw him host, you huh. know. Maybe he's not someone you'd want to have host every time, but people should all kind of learn the skill. And he, he was very good when I saw him do it once or twice. I wanted to ask you, so when you're talking about that Lion's Den show, so, I mean, to me, part of the appeal of, of Open Mic is that unexpected, unpredictable kind of bad c- comedy that will sort of arise or people who aren't even comedians but it sort of draws an element of people who you're just want to talk tired, to you're tired you're huddled masses yearning <laughs> to breathe free <laughs> or homeless yeah well, yeah, yeah, yeah sure i mean yeah cuz i've i've there's been several guys who i you know at the open mic i'm like that dude is clearly schizophrenic yeah. there would be some signature weirdos that would come into the Chicago open mics. There was this older woman, uh, she had to be in her 50s, named Virginia Hanneman, who would come in and she would just read from, talk about uh, repurposing a work, she would read from (laughs) a version of Dr. Zhivago where she was having sex with Dr. Zhivago and stuff like that. Like She was writing herself into her own erotic romantic fantasies and just reading it out loud. Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. Yeah, because there's this lady that comes down to the open mic here, uh, Georgie Kunkel. She's like 90. She's that 94 year old lady. I remember her. And she comes down, and every time, every time, I'm just like, I'm just like, just please make it through your set. Just don't. She always doesn't. She usually burn the light too. Oh, of course, every every time, every time. I think she. And then I'm I'm afraid to play her off. I don't want anything to startle her. Poor frail bird heart. Yeah. You well, know, you know what? But the funny thing is, like, she usually is very warmly received by the crowd just because she's this old lady who's up yeah, there. Yeah, and right? it's kind of like, remarkable because she's pretty. Uh, she's pretty sharp. You know, she's like ninety three, ninety four, and she's a pretty sharp old I, lady. I don't know if comedy is her thing, but uh, it, it's weird. Well, like, she got a little late start, but <laughs> she's a little. She's still, you know, twenty years from now, she's gonna kill when she's one hundred and ten. <laughs> it's gonna be an amazing thing to see. Yeah, there's this lady in New York named Barbara Totish. She's an older lady, and she's kind of your classic, like, foil on the head kind of, like, weird conspiracy theorist. But mm-hmm. then every time she starts ranting, I'm like, well, I agree with all that, though. <laughs> 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 They're giving the children pills to make them obey. I'm like, yeah, yeah they are. Yeah. That makes sense. You know she's got some that, good that points. Is, that is what they're doing. <laughs> That's funny. Let's see, do you remember your first open mic? I mean, it would it have to have been – oh, it wasn't the lion's den. It was, um, it was before I left college in Memphis, there was a uh, Bally's Casino that had a comedy club that you could drive – I could drive 45 minutes from Memphis down into Mississippi uh, to this casino, and I could do an open mic night. Huh. So I would do comedy at this open mic night, or they did an improv set. That was your very first time? Yes. How, how long – how much time did you do? Uh, they give you like five minutes there because there well, weren't that many people yeah. that would go, and you would be in front of a, a group of people who were in a casino on a Wednesday night, like wow. you know, <laughs> and then who happened to wander into the comedy club. Did, but that's a good place did to you start. Do well, sometimes I did. Well, you know, what you about your first time though? Your very first time going up on the stage and doing your bits. I think it went pretty well. You know, I, 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 I like I said, the audience was like couple old ladies and old men who had just wandered in Taking but there was the also slots. an improv group there mm. you, that's why you like to have an improv group on a show that's your built-in audience of people <laughs> who probably even like your yeah. stuff you know the, like the bigger the improv group the better then yeah, yeah. exactly but uh i can remember one of the girls I, da- I i dated a girl that was in that improv group uh i don't know if i dated her later or before i did the open mic i feel like before so we had broken up maybe or something but anyway um hmm. 
Yeah, so that's how I ended up doing that. Uh, I, uh, what did I have? I had. It's so funny, you know. You learn like how to say things. I, I remember I did this joke about I, when I was in uh, college. I had a gay roommate named Courtney, and he dated a guy who was a Catholic priest. He dated an actual Catholic Whoa. priest who was the head of the student Catholic center named Father Darren. So I would come home to my dorm room and Father Darren would just be in there. <laughs> and one day I came home and they had they had been there and left and they they were they had rented the Exorcist Jesus Christ Superstar <laughs> and this movie called Gospel about a nun that breaks her vows. I'm like you guys aren't so much religious as you're just like into Catholicism <laughs> as like a hobby, you know. So I had this whole like long bit about that and like how i was like how can he be gay if he's a priest like catholicism comes out against homosexuality huh. and my roommate courtney was like well he doesn't believe everything the bible says <laughs> and i'm like that's his only job <laughs> as a priest you don't have to be able to do anything all you have to do is believe everything <laughs> the bible says. that's the only requirement is to believe everything the bible says so he's not a priest, and we got in like this big fight over it. So I did like a bit about that one time at the casino, and I had this. Uh, and that's uh, it's, it's probably funnier now because I wasn't very funny then. I had like this gay dude come up to me after and go, "You need to watch what you say about gay people." <laughs> and I was like, "You're right. I shouldn't go after the fucking a priest crowd." <laughs> Well, you have a bit uh, about the Pentecostals too, right? Did you you have a Pentecostal family, or you grew up in that area? Did I did, you? yeah. I, I was raised Pentecostal. My grandfather was a Pentecostal minister. Uh, he was also a farmer and a coal miner. He was wow. all three things. Wow, that's like he Americana. was busy all week. <laughs> yeah, he never slept. That's right. Yeah, I mean, he really would literally. How many kids did he have? He had six kids. Oh, that's not that's. Um, yeah, uh, you know, my girlfriend's, her mom is one of 14. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Holy shit. And my girlfriend's one of six. Wow. Um, so but they're, they're the opposite. Same mom and dad, 14? Yeah, but they're the opposite. I was West Virginia Pentecostal, and my girlfriend is Connecticut Jewish. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what a combo. So very different, very different. And those That's are the guys that speak in tongues and all that, right? Pentecostal, they spoke in tongues, yeah. Um, and they would also shake and feel the power of the Lord, and you'd slap, the preacher would slap oh, you Benny in the Hinn, forehead. Benny Hinn stuff. And you'd fall down, and you'd shake, and you would, you know. You did would you ever get smacked upside the head healed. in the name of the Lord? I don't think I ever did that, but I did speak in tongues sincerely, like, you know, many times, and I can tell you that it was a very interesting experience. It's a very emotional experience. Very cathartic, I imagine. Very cathartic in, um, you know, but it's like a ritual, right? Like the whirling dervishes or whatever. It's the, every you can get worked up over almost different, anything. Yeah, think. different sort of. It's like anything else in life. I think you kind of fake it till you make it. So <laughs> there's a placebo when effect when yeah. you're yeah when you're very young. They start to you know show you how it works and what it, what's involved, and you kind of start to do it when you're praying, and you watch your parents doing it when they're praying. So at first you're just kind of making the sounds. But then when you get older and you're really like you're really praying, you know, it's really it just comes over you. And it really is like kind of a instinctual thing that just comes out of you. Yeah, for huh. sure. Yeah. Uh, now, I don't I don't really have those <coughs> beliefs anymore. Um, and I like to joke. I have jokes about them. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, do, I also don't think that it's like complete bullshit. I don't believe in God. So I don't think that God is causing it, but I, d I also don't believe that they're they're not faking it. It's real. It's really coming out of them. You know? Yeah. I mean, I think it's good to have. Uh, you know, it's an expression of someone's spirit. It truly is. It's yeah. an expression of someone's someone's inner self. It is. It really is. You know. Huh. But uh, yeah, they would do that. They would. You know, but like the funny part is, is when you you know that's like a spiritual thing. It's like a thing that shouldn't be sullied by earthly concerns really you know but then the funny part about churches is that they're always filled with like the dumbest old ladies and stuff who ruin everything like <laughs> i can tell you that my like we we had this like poor lady in our church who would like get healed every week and feel the spirit <laughs> every week again. and like and like shake and fall down every week and my grandma would kind of like make comments like you know she felt the spirit again like she was being <laughs> gauche 
by, you know, you, you kind of weren't supposed to speak in tongues every week because that meant that God was like touching you. You know what yeah. I mean? Was so this woman was so special that God touched her every week, yet she couldn't hold down a job at the local convenience store. You know? <laughs> and so now everybody's jealous because God's like singling her out all the jealous, time. Jealous right? or they just think she's like tacky, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like, you know, so there's a fine line there. Were you raised with any sort of uh, religious? Not at all, faith? man. Not at all. Uh, which is odd growing up in sort of uh, Indiana, and not sort of Indiana, but distinctly <laughs> Indiana. Uh, but yeah, like my mom wasn't very religious, and it was a uh, you know single parent household. And uh, I do distinctly remember though uh, noticing every Sunday like all of my friends would disappear for the afternoon, right? And I remember asking her like, "Where the hell is everybody?" At? You know, and she's, "Oh, they're probably in church." And I was like, well, why don't we go to church? And I don't really know if, like, that young is, like, the best age to be making spiritual decisions or whatever. But she was like, yeah, well, what church do you want to go to? Which, like, blew my mind, right? Because I thought, oh, well, I I thought there was just one big church that everybody went to, you know. So we spent uh, months going to just all sorts of different churches. Shopping around. Yeah. (laughs) And when I – and it's so funny because when we came back from all these different churches after doing this for a while – I was just so bored and sick and tired of the whole, like, church. I was like, you know what? <laughs> the, the, fuck that. Like, if they want to go to church on Sundays, that's their thing. I'm not doing it. That's kind of sweet that your mom was like, if you want to go, I'll take you wherever yeah. you want to go. She took me to a bunch of churches, uh, all, you know, all the different flavors. And, uh, you know, for a lot of people, it can't hurt. For the most it part, it's just like, hey, keep your shit together. Yeah. Fucking take care of your kids, you know? Don't gamble your money away. Ethical Don't get drunk all the time. Yeah. yeah, you know. But a lot there's a lot of horseshit baggage that comes with it too. Well, I was never raised with any faith at all, and I went to a Catholic. What was it? Latin Mass a while back, and just to check it, just to see what it was going on, you know. Yeah. And drop some acid and go to that. <clears> it was man. pretty cool though. I I, I liked it because it's a whole production. That's what I was like. Oh, this is. It's like a communal thing, and there's, there's a whole, you know, well, people walk down the aisle with the following the one guy, and well, someone fires up the organ upstairs. There's something to be said for ritual, too, like ritual behavior, yeah, yeah. because uh, more and more... There's I mean, communities bringing everyone together. Well, yeah, and more and more there's less opportunity for that, less opportunity for, you know, group ritual like that, and I think people start to feel a little disconnected. But from, the sermon you know. was boring. I was well, kind of disappointed with the... As like doing a little public speaking, doing comedy, I was kind of like, this guy is kind of bombing right <laughs> Punch now. Punch it up, dude. He was, well, he wasn't a very good speaker, and he kind of stuttered, and it wasn't that well written, and it just seemed... You I pulled was him aside like, later. Look, I got some tags for this sermon. Let me well, I just... I was kind of disappointed. And yeah. I was like, oh, that's your job? You just come out and talk for an hour, and it's not even that good? Well, the best churches, I think there are probably good churches. They're the ones that focus on, you know, helping out the community. So yeah. helping the old ladies who don't have anybody, helping the kids who are, like, maybe going to fuck off and not go to school and get into drugs. Yeah. And then they got, like, a young preacher who, you know, even if his sermon isn't, like, mind-blowing, it's at least relevant to your life, you know? Like... But there are just so many churches that are just losing people like crazy because they're just kind of going through the motions of the rituals over and over. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's like you said earlier about uh, Catholicism and homosexuality and all that. I guess the Pope recently decided, you know what, let's uh, let's uh, try to bump up our numbers here a little bit. Maybe the gay thing <laughs> isn't so bad. You know? I think, you know what, I think fuck him, though. Fuck him. <laughs> yeah. Because it clearly says in the Bible, which is his handbook, it clearly comes down on homosexuality. Yeah, he's like, who am I to judge? Who well, you're am the I to judge? Pope, well, man. you're the Pope. That's and if sense. you really feel that way, don't be the Pope <laughs> and don't be Catholic anymore. Yeah. The, the, the Catholic Church is one of the worst organizations in the history of the world. Yeah. Yeah. I read this book recently about the Renaissance. It just talked about the Popes during the Renaissance. That's when there you was, could buy were, your way into it, right? Oh, and they did a lot. And there, there was a Pope that it was well known that he was having sex with his own daughter. Mm, yeah. I don't mean it was well known in Rome. I mean it was well known throughout Christendom. There were orgy parties that lasted for a week in the papacy. There just was rampant corruption. Yeah. You know, they sold sold the bones of saints that were really chicken bones. If you want if you were rich and you wanted to go to heaven, you could pay to get into heaven. This went on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds I mean, of years. Now, people go... Well, I hate to admit it, but you're kind of making Catholicism sound appealing. At this <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, here's the thing. So people go, well, that was a long time ago, and the church fixed itself. And I'm like, 
no, fuck that. When you have a religion and the lead guy is fucking his own daughter, you kind of have to go, you know what? Why don't we just like give this a break for a while? It doesn't seem to be working out. Yeah. Because all of the, the, the scandal with uh, children and priests, that all it's all tied together. Yeah. It's all part of one history. Yeah. Yeah, like it's all too. part of what this caused this directly. Well, that's what that made me think about is, you know, with all the pedophilia scandals, like, that's not a new thing. I mean, priests just didn't start doing that in the 50s and 60s. That means it must have been going on for hundreds of fucking hundreds years. Of well, years. Part of Which, that's a, that to me is a huge nightmare. Yeah, part of the problem is they're involved in an environment that uh, sets forth this idea that is very... Uh, Anti, like, against, sexually, sexually, it contradicts your entire biology yeah, as it, a living they, they being. They put them in a very sexually repressive environment, and then, like, you know, uh, in celibacy and all that, and then, like, here, go nuts, let's see what happens, and obviously some sexual perversions are probably going to... But, you know, there, there were some things I was reading on, like, Rotten.com, which is a reputable website, by yeah, the way, Rotten. bulletproof yeah, source of I get all my news right, from Rotten. It's <laughs> either that or Drudge Report, right? Yeah. But they have these, you know, a lot of these old popes were just the most ridiculous scoundrels. You know, like tithing was invented because uh, they, they, they were broke and they needed money. So like, okay, we need to get some more income in here. All right, here's what you can do. You give 15% of your shit to us and uh, we'll forgive whatever. For and hundreds of years, the uh, Catholic uh, Church was COBRA. It was Cobra. a world domination organization of evil people who? who didn't care what they had to do to take over the world. And the Pope was Destro. Destro. The Pope was the Destro, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just some solid G.I. Joe references. Almost yeah. as good as the Paganini. For a second, I thought you meant Cobra, like the CIA operation, but then I figured... Or the health plan. That's it. The health plan was the first thing I thought of. Yeah. The Cobra health plan. Or the plan car insurance. The, or, or I wonder like what kind of insurance priests have. Do they have a plan? Uh, I think they're insured by the Lord, Jared, sure. and uh, God. God just heals them. Yep, he, they're on the. Well, on Bill Hicks had that great bit about uh, the Pope and his bulletproof uh, Pope mobile. Yeah. Like, oh, there's faith in action for you right yeah. there. Right? Oh, I thought like, that was a Drew Carey. I think I heard mm. Bill Hicks do it. I'm not sure. I like, if the Pope needs bulletproof glass, what the hell chance do the rest of us have? Was that how the Bill Hicks one? No, was? no. Bill Hicks. I remember the punch was "There's faith in action." I remember that those words. So I know that he had a bit Shit, about. Shit. Maybe they both had the same bit, and they we're, we're just like discovering that. I never <laughs> made the connection. But for me, with Drew Carey, it's all the big dick jokes. That's the ones that I remember from. Well, him. he has all kinds. He has a big dick. Is that the joke? Or no, he he actually put out a book called like hundred and one big dick jokes, and that's uh, all it is. Is just like big. And I'm the guy that sat down and read that book <laughs> cover to cover. To cover. <laughs> I did. What's I yeah, well, a handy was, bathroom reader? Can you know? Yeah, you know, it's, there's some there's some lines in there. All right, so uh, I know you guys have uh, another show tonight, Comedy yeah, Underground. Yeah, two shows tonight. Uh, so uh, we might want to start to wrap this up. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else uh, Jared wants to plug. I know you're with the at Jared Logan on Twitter. Yeah, and please watch Best Week Ever on Friday nights. And um, please tweet at me anytime. I like it when people say hello to me. So that's just at Jared Logan. Nice. James, you got anything uh, you want to go out on? Any uh, big news in the world of uh, James Milton there? Big news in the world of James Milton. Uh, I think I'm going to go to Delicatus after this and get the Rain Man sandwich, which is the roast beef. <laughs> There's a Rain Man sandwich? It's called the Rain Man. It's, it's the Sean Kemp sandwich. Uh, it, comes, it's, it comes with roast beef and 13 children. Boom. 13 Nailed of his it. kids. So I'm going to go order one of those. That's really the only thing I have to plug. Um, I'm yeah. on Twitter at Jimmy Miltz. Say hi to me. Troll me. Whatever. Boom. And uh, I am at Voodoo Chicken. V u d u c h i k i n. Uh, don't ask why. Thanks for coming out, guys. Uh, Jared, it was a pleasure. Thank James, you. As always. Thank and, you, sir. Uh, we're out.